What's up, people? Welcome back to Noise Avocation Podcast. Uh, as always, I am Ryan here with Jeremy. I am. And doing? you've heard us talk about John multiple times on the show, I'm sure, and referencing records and different cool pressings and other shit like that. So today here we have brought John into the studio with us to talk about jazz and such things. And it's really nice that you uh, invited us into the Noise Avocation Studios. It's pretty cool to be here with you. The luxurious carpeted walls of Noise Avocation Podcast. This um, is beautiful. <laughs> there was a lot of sweat and labor that went into this room because we put it together in July. Yep. You do have atmosphere. You got the lighting down. You know, it yeah, we try nice. to make it romantic in here for everybody. Yeah. Um, social media stuff, you can find me at Soundwave Slave on Instagram. Uh, you can follow the podcast at Noise Avocation Podcast on Facebook, Noise Avocation on Instagram. Uh, you can subscribe to the YouTube channel at Noise Avocation. You can email us at noiseavocation at gmail.com. And if you forgot all that, you can go to any of the social media That'll be in the episode description, and there will be a link tree to lead you to all of that stuff. If you're feeling frisky, you can follow me at holdfast underscore 517 at Instagram. You got to spell that out. I say that every time. You should know it by now. So how you doing, John? We're doing great. It's a lot of fun, and you know, listening to a lot of music and hearing some great stories yeah, yeah. here as we get ready to get started. Definitely. So it's it's lots of fun. And I just want to say, you know, it's really great, you know, what you and Ryan are are here doing, you know, kind of spreading the good word about all different forms of music. You know, I know I've sat and learned a lot just about, you know, hip hop, you know, especially there where I'm probably the absolute weakest, you know, but just and then some of the metal, you know, Ryan, you've turned me on to you know, so many great things, you know, like the obituary record. and Yeah, yeah. And then it escapes me, Ryan. I Storm keep. That's the other yeah, one. I figured and, that was going to be what you mentioned. And the one that we decorated the Christmas tree to. Um, <laughs> try to remember the name of it now. But so many great things. And that's what great podcasts like these do. You know, you get done listening to what you guys talk about and go check out the list. And, man, I'm hitting title and booking through your right list. On. And there's very little that, you know, He's like, wow, you know, very little that doesn't work for me. So it's really, really cool that you guys are out there doing such cool stuff. It's appreciated. Thank you. We like to think that we don't listen to bad music, but we don't. it's all open to interpretation. So who really knows? Well, we don't tell you what we really listen to. Yeah. Um, something I wanted to mention this before we get started in here. Did either of you know that Nora Jones is Ravi Shanker's daughter? Yes. Mm -hmm. Fuck it. I'm, how am I the only one that didn't know that? Oh, dude, when that when that record first hit, that was part of the big push. Yeah, yeah, like the, um, re, the new Blue Note back then. Yeah, that was, a, and Jeremy, you nailed it. That's yeah. exactly what happened because she was part of that whole big relaunch of Blue Note. And, and she specifically requested that she be on Blue Note, even though she had offers from bigger labels or whatever. Like she said, that was what she grew up with and what she wanted to be on. Yeah, and, you know, you look at, they recorded that record, and it was just massive at the time. And, you know, that's one where you just come across it in really odd ways. I actually came across her in uh, the CBS News morning show. They were actually oh, doing right a preview of that record, and they were sampling stuff. Because, you know, by that time, everybody was hearing Don't Know Why. You know, oh, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, exactly. You that's, know? I mean, that's how I heard. obviously heard about her. But then... They took you through it, and then what hooked me with that was Cold, Cold Heart. You're listening to somebody do an old, old country tune like yep. that, and you're just like, wow, and it works. And, you know, kind of like the Noise Avocation podcast. You turned off the TV, and you booked down to the record store, and I grabbed that and brought it home. But, yeah, they, uh, Nora and her dad weren't really close at the time. I don't know what that relationship looks like now. I just but. know, like— that is she, he alive there still? there was a relation. Is he alive? I don't know. Yeah, I couldn't tell And you. I honestly, in sure. full disclosure, my old lady told me that, so I didn't know that until probably like 10 years ago. I literally learned that this morning. Yeah, that's what I mean. <laughs> Like, I was reading through some shit about Blue Note and just like 
how it started and whatever. And I have that big uncompromising expression book that I was uh, going through, like leading into this episode. And I just didn't know. Like I like I like her voice quite a bit, and it's a good album. And I've heard it. Blah blah blah. Uh, originally, like when I heard it as a kid, I never would have known it was on Blue Note, but I also wasn't really aware of Blue Note, like as a younger kid. So I guess none of those connections ever met to me. And it just seemed like, I don't know, Ravi Shankar was some dude from like the Middle East, like because of his sound and stuff. And just, I don't know, it just never clicked that way. But I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, it's a great record. Yeah. I, uh, I also dismissed it when it came out but i was like you know hard, i only you were listened in, to hardcore hard, yeah. and like yep. and if you didn't listen to anything else fuck you you know what i mean like yeah. and that's not fair because i remember when it came out that song being everywhere but i do remember being like i like her voice but i i didn't dig any deeper into it like i was saying before we even started it you don't hear it until you like open your ears and you're like, oh, and something clicks. And with her, that's kind of how it worked for me. Yeah. And at the time with that one, you know, just being an old dude, you know, that record sounded so different. Yeah. You know, it was just unlike anything that was out there at the time. You know, it wasn't really traditional jazz. It wasn't really blues. It wasn't your. Your Diana Krall yeah, you're, you're uh, right. kind of cocktail jazz stuff, you know. At, at that time, you know, when Nora took off, you know, Diana Krall too was just really starting, uh, you know, with Live in Paris and some of the stuff through there, and they really took off right about the same time. And you know, Diana Krall was obviously working that whole much more traditional jazz piece, and there's some wonderful stuff that she's done but Nora Jones at the time it was just such a different sound yeah and it had that crossover appeal yeah you had a little bit of blue a little bit of country yeah, yeah. you know there's a little bit there's a little bit of I wouldn't call it Cajun but there's a little southern almost you know I don't want to say Louis Armstrong that kind of but there's a little bit of New Orleans in that record too you know and there's just so many diverse pieces that came in and made that record really really interesting yeah now I'm gonna have to get out of here and listen to that again it's the one in her I don't think it's ever been as good as that one right for her I know I bought stuff for her quite a while going forward and i just never found anything that could touch stuck it, with eh? me like that one did it's yeah. hard to have a debut that yeah no. is that good that you repeat live up to because like everybody wants a follow-up sophomore album that's going to be like okay what else do you got for me because this was so good now what are you going to bring to the table next because you pretty much dished out like your whole playbook in the first album it's like the hardest one man you got the mo like most precious mo most precious most fucking it's pressure and yeah. yeah it's like nauseomatic when we talk about right that and also. then you're not as hungry hard to, like how do you find yeah. that hunger although i was reading some people say that it was written was better but oh really is what it is yeah that's... um but anyways so blue note recently just celebrated its 84th anniversary of their t first two releases which would have been march 3rd 1939 um the releases were Originally put out on 78s, they were by artists, um, I'm going to butcher this name, I believe it's Mead, but I want to say Mod, but it doesn't look like Mod, so I'm going to say Mead. Uh, Mead Lux Lewis and Albert Ammons were the first two artists that were put out on Blue Note, and I have like a little timeline of how it happened, so Alfred Lyon, who was the head of Blue Note, went to Carnegie Hall just before Christmas in 1938 to see a few or to see a concert and then a few weeks later he went to Cafe Society to talk to Lewis who played the first show that he was at and then also Ammons who played the first show as well he approached them with wanting to record them and put them in a studio and try to make something with them and which they agreed he said that they'd be paid for it and they went to, I can't remember the name of the, the studio. It was a radio station in New York at the time. But 
Lion went in there, recorded him, paid him for the session, but then he couldn't pay for the masters from the studio. So he had to wait two, three weeks, go back, get them, and then he released them through what would have been his label, Blue Note. And at the time, it was like very hard to push anything out because there was no music distributors, there wasn't very many record stores, there wasn't even really like the concept of marketing at all at that point. You know, music was... It wasn't new, but as far as hitting like a mainstream media, it was new. It hadn't been tapped into yet. What year was it? 38, yeah. originally. But then 39 was when they put out the first records. That was when Blue Note was founded. Um, originally, the label was yellow, white, and blue instead of white and blue as it's known today. And the first two singles that came out came out red, white, and black. Because of a printer issue, the printer printed the blue note, which would have been blue, black, and then the offset to the label was red, which was supposed to be yellow. I thought it was cool that he, like, within three months, approached these guys that he seen play and then was starting. He didn't know what he was starting. Like, obviously, you don't know that you're starting a legacy when you're starting a legacy. But the fact that he went right before Christmas... And then by the time March 1939 came around, he was releasing two singles on what would have been Blue Note. I thought that was really cool to read into. And the book that I have has like the original manifesto that shows what they were releasing, when they were releasing it, who was on the album. And then Francis Wolf came in like shortly after that and started tying in all the photography and stuff. But I looked up the records on Discogs, and originally they only made 25 of each. So there was 25 of the first single, uh, which would had Melancholy and Solitude on there, and then the second was Boogie Woogie Stomp and Boogie Woogie Blues, and they only made 25 of each record. So finding them now is a challenge for sure. And they're, the last ones that were on there only sold for like 30 to $40, but... When you go into the for sale, even if you want to buy a beat up cracked copy, they're like eight hundred to a thousand dollars just for the seventy eight. Oh yeah, beautiful stuff though. You know that's the thing too that made Blue Note so great. You know you look at and I'm sure in the book, you know it's talked about. You know just how uh, Wolf and Lion, you know, were just fans of the music. You know, and that started in Germany. You know where they're both from and. You know, they basically escaped Germany, you know, in front of the war and came to the U.S. And they just loved what they heard. And I think that's what made the label so great as it went along, is everything Wolf and Lion did was really from the perspective of just being a fan. And they took and brought in artists that they liked. You know, I don't want to get ahead of Ryan, but you look at, you look at Monk. It was a yeah, yeah. perfect example. Monk would have been my next go-to, yeah. so you're right on track. You know, you look at how long Blue Note worked with Monk. You know, and Monk was so, at that time, so avant-garde and so angular and just different. You know, Monk was just, Monk was just a different guy. There's just no way around it. And the music was really, really unique. But they believed in him so much. They, they stuck with him, I believe, right? Was it for about five years, I think it is. Yeah. You know, and they weren't made of money or anything. They were trying to keep things going, but they had that kind of belief in their artists, you know. And, and it's just like an independent cre- label in the punk rock scene, man. Yep. Oh, yeah, it wanna... reminds me of Chess Records, too. Where they yeah. were fans, same thing as the blue, you know. Even Motown too Motown, did the yeah. same thing. Like uh, they were all legitimate fans of the music and wanted it to be distributed out there and when, they, in a time that it really wasn't. I mean, Motown was later on down the road, but especially like in Blue Note time in 1939, 1940, there wasn't really a whole lot going on. And you're not, and back then you're not looking at it as a financial fucking yeah. plan. You're just like you said, you're a fan. You want other people to hear it. So, and imagine like approaching an artist now 
and being like, hey, I want to record you and make a demo with you and put you out on my label. It costs you literally thousands, like just to get your foot in the door in that. Right, right. Between studio time and then pressing up the record to have enough copies of it and distribution. And then you got to hope that the shit sells. And it's, oh, that's just a totally different world. man. Yeah. But back then, it was an untapped into market. Like I said, they didn't have a way to distribute it. Like they had two stores, I believe it was originally, that agreed to put their records on the shelves. And then otherwise, you had to order it out of a magazine. The record cost $1.50 in 1939, which was the double the price of what a standard record cost at that time. I didn't get the reasoning for that, but I'm assuming just so they could recoup expenses from paying studio time and all that, because at this time they weren't recording with Rudy Van Gelder and they didn't have access to his studio like they did further on down the road. $1.50 in 1939, I'd imagine, is probably a lot of money. Yeah, I don't know. What was minimum wage in 1939? Like 50 cents or something? 40 cents? There was minimum wage. Yeah, there probably wasn't. Child child labor and shit. No, I don't. I'm not 100% on that, but you know what I mean? It's like, in only 25, you'd have to have some sort of higher. I'm going to look it up while you're. A better paying job than the average Joe, like now, where, you know, every, music is access, accessible to everybody. But back then, I don't think, you know, that your normal dude could fucking go out and buy a Blue Note record for $1.50 without, like, two of his kids not eating for a month. I think yeah. you're probably right. You know what I mean? I'm going to say that's probably, I wouldn't even know where to guess, but I'm going to bet you that's probably 25 or 30 bucks just hey. without even, we'll see how close we yeah, are when Ryan know. does the I have no idea. Does the 45 cents an hour for white people, 35 oh. cents an hour for black, because this was during yep. segregation and all that. So you would have had to have worked three hours just to buy one Blue Note record. Damn. Which, when you think about it, though, for, like, the average person now, like, a record's 25 30 sometimes $40. The average income's of, like, $15, $16 an hour or whatever. Or at least, like, in northern Michigan. Uh, like, you know, California and New York, it's higher. But, like, it kind of equals out to the same. But you're getting a whole album versus two singles. Right. And you get it on a 33 and not a giant fucking piece of shellac shit. (laughs) And that's still be like three times as much as I would today. Like when I think about it, if I was working back then, it would cost me three times as much compared to today to get those two songs versus that fucking double album coming in next week. You know what I mean? It's crazy. So before Monk, um, Blue Note, there was actually, I Quebec was like one of their first big stars. Uh, I shouldn't say star, but one of the first people that kind of like started taking the reins around Blue Note. And I don't know exactly how long he lasted with the company, but I do know that he did put out quite a few records with them. And then there was Monk, and then it went on to like the 50s to where you picked up all the recognizable names like Hank Mobley, Lee Morgan. Uh, Wayne Shorter wasn't until 64, I want to say. That sounds right. Yeah, 64. Um, But they had all the names that you would pretty much like who the who's who in jazz even now was pretty much the starting roster for Blue Note at the time. But like, None of these people had flourished into what they are now at the time. And they did have Miles for a brief period in the 50s also. Uh, I want to say it was like 56 or 57 or somewhere around there, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I think you're pretty you're pretty close. What like got you into jazz originally? I remember you said you played in high school band and stuff like that. Like, because to me, like just reading your Instagram posts and stuff, like you have a more detailed perspective of breaking down the music because you've played the music. Me, I've never played a fucking saxophone or a clarinet or a trumpet, trombone, whatever. So it's harder for me to dissect the music in a way to understand how the compositions are made. For me, it's really, yeah, I mean, we we learned to love jazz uh, just playing in the jazz band. That was really the first exposure. But where it really started to click I found my way in kind of through the back door. For me, it was the old Chicago records. 
So I like Chicago too, and the Chicago Transit Authority. And you're hearing horns there and you're hearing a horn stuff and like blood, sweat and tears and some of that stuff. So you like, wow, okay, there's some stuff here. And then back in the day, and I see now, I had just read a, something here this morning I thought was kind of sad. I was always kind of a night owl as a kid. And WCMU here yep. always did nightside jazz and yep. blues yep. overnight. And I found more stuff there too. You know, everything from Wenton Marsalis, you know, which was really kind of my my first piece into it. And then now we'll date ourselves a little bit, you know, like in high school, you know, as Sting came along and was the solo stuff and doing the nothing like the sun stuff. And, and you heard all that on there? Yeah. And That's all that sort of awesome. stuff. You, know, you would hear everything. You know, that Nightside Jazz and Blues program did more for me back then. And that kind of woke the the, the hunger because I was always just a, you know, give me my give me my Van Halen and right, give me right. my whatever. And the thing too was as you started to play, it's one thing to be in a rock band and you guys know how that all works. And you know, you you're a drummer and you sit down and just bang away and keep the time. Where like in jazz, what you started to learn was the importance of the interaction between to me, a good player has to listen to the melody line and understand what's going on and then react to that instead of and then drive the time. But it was getting into that, you know, and then being exposed to all kinds of different stuff, you know, like in our jazz band at the time, we were we were pretty good. We had a great instructor, his name was Dean Christopher at the time, and we went to all kinds of great places and you know, we Jazz Lab won there at CMU. We got to play in the Detroit Metro Jazz Festival and all these sorts of stuff. And you're around good players and you kind of understand what all this stuff is like. And pretty soon you were really hungry for it. And then you obviously go into all of the, the entry level stuff. You know, you, you get your kind of blue and you get right. your love supreme and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, for me, that's really how it started. Just kind of heard a Chicago record, thought it was pretty cool. Blood, sweat, and tears. Heard that, and then start listening overnight on the radio, and that was where everything happened for me. Everything. Yeah, I recall um, listening to that overnight program too. And is that still around? It's actually. I just read it's going away. That is crazy because I remember hearing a lot of blues on that. On like a Friday, is it? What did you say, Saturday or Friday uh, night? Friday into Saturday I, or Saturday Friday. into Sunday. Oh man, what a great program! Yeah, and yeah. It's just a shame that stuff like that's going away. But we learned so much there, and there was another program that they had too called Echoes. I think that's going to hang Echoes. around. Uh, the host was a guy at that time named Bill DiLiberto, and they would do jazz, world music, things like that. I was always looking for new things to inform my playing. Right, you right. Because you want to do more than just boom, ta, boom, boom. You know, you want to understand. I wanted to know about South African rhythms. I wanted to understand Middle Eastern rhythms. And, you know, just to bring something different to the table. And then yeah, like out. in your mind, you need to do something that stands out, but yet still fits in perfectly with everybody else. I mean, that's kind of how I see it is very, very, like, delicate I just never wanted to be boring and predictable right, when I played right. and wanted to find stuff. And then you just kind of let it all happen. And to me, it was just finding stuff and buying records. And luckily, you know, we had some, some st uh, places around here you could get stuff and hear stuff. And, yeah, so it's been, for me, it's been a love affair with jazz for about 40 years. That's great. What did you start off playing originally? What do you mean? The, like? Your instrument in oh, school. drums, drums. Always okay. been a, well. I take that back. The first thing they gave me when I was in school was a baritone. So it was one of these great big honking things that you carry. It took about two weeks of beginning band to get out of that, and then straight to straight to the drums. And then you know I had family that played guitar. You know, and my dad was a piano player. And so you have musical background. Oh yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, we had a lot of a lot of music in the house. The only bad thing was is the music in the house was mostly bad. Uh, <laughs> yeah, isn't that know, always the case? You sit there and it's like I was, like I can still see the the Engelbert Humperdinck's greatest hits record sitting in front of the stereo. Yeah. you know, or the Eddie Arnold. Yeah, those two. You know? 
all the Perry Como yeah. or all that stuff, you know. But, you know, you find some value in stuff like that. But all I knew is, you know, the first eight track I brought home and dropped that in the stereo with the first rate, it was sounded a little bit different, you know. So, anyway. Can you tell the Miles story? <laughs> Yeah, I want, oh, I want I've heard it. Story. I've heard it, but Jeremy's never heard it. I don't think, or not from your mouth, at least. Well, one of the coolest things we kind of touched on a little bit was uh, when I was a senior in. Well, I just finished my senior year in high school, and we were the jazz band there had a, had a really good year, and the jazz band was invited to come down and play at the. Uh, Detroit Montreux Jazz Festival. I don't know what they call it now, but that's what it was back at the time. And I think it's still just Detroit Jazz it Festival. It could be. That Wayne Shorter album that came out not that long ago. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. And so we were, we got to play at, at Hart Plaza, which was kind of cool. And we got to play in front of a pretty decent crowd at a good time of day, just this little high school jazz band. Well, being seniors, you know, we were a little older and just kind of moving around and you know the word kind of comes through you know hey, we all knew miles davis mm-hmm. was in town that night and miles i don't remember if maybe you guys are a little more better on detroit than i am but you have Hart plaza and then somewhere just down just down the way is a little theater and i can't remember the name of the theater but it was like you see the miles davis it's uh, fox theater i'm not sure anymore I, i'm really not and you just knew Miles Davis was there. And we hear that what Miles likes to do after a show is he'll find the jam session and go up and play. Well, we got wind of where the jam session was going to be because you're in the Montreux Jazz Festival. People are talking and doing stuff. Oh, yeah. So there was a group of us that said, okay, we're going to the top floor of the poncha train. So we went to the top floor of the poncha train. And up there is the jam session. And people are going in and going out and going in and going out and playing. And so there's a couple of us, and I'm taking my turn, you know, playing with people. And guess who walks in? You know, in comes Miles with his horn. And while I'm playing, he unpacks, comes up, warms up, and plays. So we got to play a little bit of time with Miles Davis. And you're scared as... Dude, I'm oh, fucking no. shaking right now just <laughs> as you're telling it. Like, in my mind, I'm thinking, like, oh, my God, I'd be, like, stuck. And you're flipping out. Yeah, dude. And everybody in the room is just like, he's here. You know, it's mm-hmm. just it's so cool. And you got to do your couple of minutes with him, you know, and I got done. Of course, you're going to get kicked off the drums now. You're out of here, kid. But got all done, and you're just, you go, he walks up to you. You did good, kid. And off Damn. you go. It was the greatest thing. It was really, really cool. You know, and you hear so many stories about Miles. You know, he could be notoriously tough on people or wasn't always real oh, friendly right, or right, whatever. Right. In that setting, you know, and watching him with all of these people in the room and just do it, he was great with people. You know, he wanted to just make music, and that's what people did, and it was a lot of fun. And, yeah, it was one of the one of the highlights of of life was oh, definitely. actually getting to sit with him like that. It was really, really cool. And he was very, very gracious with us all. That's awesome. Even being in the same room with him it would be cool, but to get complimented would yeah. be like that's like next level type of thing. Oh. Yeah, there's not that many people that can say that. Oh, uh, he was he was fantastic. The best part was the band director walked in. Uh, <laughs> Very, oh, did he? What do you guys do? Oh. Here? You know, you know, you're like, like <laughs> It's like, guess what? This it's, was way more fun than yeah. what we did down there, dude. But he was great to us. And then, you know, I don't want to ramble on too much, but the oh, other great one we had <laughs> was, you know, we had a chance to, uh, when I was going to school, uh, going to college, I did a lost semester at uh, Western Michigan. And we were on a program board down there. So they would bring in artists. And one of the artists uh, that came through was Wynton Marsalis. And there's another one that you had always heard a lot of stories about. And my girlfriend at the time, now wife, they all were laughing because we're going to the Marsalis show. And Black Codes from the Underground is one of my very favorite records. 
one of my very, very favorite records. It's a great record. And I thought, I'm going to take this, and I'm going to find where he walks out, and I'm going to see if he'll sign it. Yeah. And she thought I was crazy. Because we go to the theater, I think it's the Miller Auditorium in Western. That's where the show was, somewhere by the big old fountain. And go to the show, carry the record in. Yeah, you're nuts. Go around, and show's over, and wait. And lo and behold, he comes out, and there's probably 15 or 20 of us sitting around. And he sat with all of us for, oh, God, probably a half an hour, just talking, encouraging people, you know, very much a teacher, you know, yeah. just talking to folks. And, yes, he signed my black codes from the underground, and it's You it's still fun. have it, I would imagine. Oh, yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> Yeah, and it's one of those great things where it's like, this is one of my favorites. And he said, you know, it's mine too. You know, which that he liked that album. Oh, all the that's time. great. It was really something, you know, to meet somebody like that too. He was just a fantastic individual. And then his brother wasn't with him anymore. At that time, Brand or Branford had gone off and done his own thing. But you also got to see uh, Jeffrey Watts, who was his drummer at the time. Kane Watts is what he's known as. And to be able to just say, you know, hello to Tane Watts and see him and, you know, tell him how great we think he is and all that stuff. That stuff just has a lasting, lasting impression. On oh, definitely, but, man. I can think of some musicians I've met over the years where, well, however it is, you build them up in your mind. And then um, when you meet them, at least in my case, it's like, they're just normal people, man. You know, it's true. Just regular, regular people. There are some people that surprise the hell yeah. out of you. I mean, same place, Western. You know, we watch the Love and Rockets and the Pixies, and Frank Black, Love and Rockets wouldn't nothing. See you later, bye, whatever. Frank Black sat out in the parking lot and talked to everybody for about an hour after the show. It's absolutely yeah. great. You know? Yeah. But yeah, just really, really interesting stuff. Jazz people like that. You know traveling around to a lot of the clinics and stuff, which was really cool. So you had you had well-known session drummers. So I got to be around drummers like Ed Sof, Steve Gadd. You got to see players like that and go to clinics, you know, and you get your, hi, hello, how you doing? And by and large, the whole community was just wonderful. That's great. I've never had a bad experience. Jazz was one of the best things that ever happened to me just the discipline of practice and then taking and interacting with the band kind of informs your life and how you interact with people and different stuff so anyway i feel great. like jazz musicians never had the i'm a rock and roll star outlook on things so the being a dickhead didn't come forward as much because you can't really hide your talent in jazz like you are you either got it or you don't in rock i mean like Sid Vicious is a good example. Like, you could be a, a face and just get away with it, skate by, and you're an icon. And you could be a total dickhead because of that ego goes to your head. But in jazz, like, you're not just going to be like, yeah, I know how to blow into a trumpet, but nothing really comes out. Like, you have to have some substance, like, to your music to be able to actually go anywhere with it. So I feel like a lot of people, and, like, the discipline that it takes to get to that point... I feel like humbled a lot of musicians to where they weren't really that arrogant. Like I know in Miles' book, it kind of he had like some hostility towards like Chet Baker and stuff, and being that he like felt like he kind of ripped off his style a little bit. But I think also he had an underlying respect for him as well. So it's cool to hear that like meeting different jazz musicians, you don't get that they say never meet your idols type of thing so like i've met some people that are kind of like eh, whatever get the fuck out of my face i'm signing this thing for you move along and they're like shooing you like you mm -hmm. can't even say a word to them but i've never gotten to meet any jazz musicians really so i've never gotten to experience that with any of them but it would be cool masigo is one that i really want to go see oh. uh, like you were just bringing that up like not that long ago I always run into people like randomly like how i met freddie madball was like entering and exiting the bathroom and that was like weird like it was the only time that maybe i felt slightly starstruck you know but then <laughs> when i realized he was like cole's height but just super wide i'm like 
you know, like more or less struck by the actual height of him because the person He's, looks, or however, in my head, you sounds so you much hold bigger. Him, yeah. yeah. And then, like I said, oh, regular old dude. Yeah. Bump into Danny Carey from Tool in the yeah. car dealership. Yep. That'll flip your mind. <laughs> yeah, or at Walmart. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my, my, uh, my old lady's friend is, or she was friends with the wife of him or whatever. Robin? Yeah. Another thing that I did want to get into in the show was Wayne Shorter, obviously. Wayne Shorter did pass on, was it March 2nd or was it March 3rd? It was March 2nd, I'm pretty sure. Thursday. It's Thursday. I was I mean, at work because I texted you. Right. That's right. Yeah. So it was Thursday. It would have been March 2nd that morning. I should have had that written down, but I had a bunch of other stuff about Wayne written down. A little bit of background, he was born in 1933 in New Jersey, uh, joined up with Blue Note in 1964. He originally wanted to be a comic book illustrator and was attending the New Jersey Art School at 14, and he said that's where he then heard Monk and Charlie Parker and Bud Powell, and then something kind of clicked for him musically, and then he then and there knew that's what he wanted to do. So he started playing shortly after that, around 14, 15. Then he did a few recordings around like 21 or 22, but they were never actually officially released anywhere, or at least not that I know of. I was trying to dig him up and try to find like some bootleg singles or something on Discogs, and I couldn't really find any. When you go back that far, it's hard to pinpoint something really. But I thought it was cool that he wanted to be a comic book illustrator. That was something that I never really knew. Uh, I did order his book this morning because I have yet to read that, so I thought that would be cool to dip into. But um, I just wanted to talk about him just in remembrance of him and like what he's done. What is your favorite? Of, or I should say not what is your exact favorite, but what is some of your favorite work that Wayne Shorter's done? When I think about Wayne Shorter, the first thing I think about is... All the musicianship and stuff is fantastic, but what he, to me, his genius was in his composition. He's a great writer. I read that like when he worked with Miles, Herbie Hancock, and others that they never once ever had to change any of his compositions. Like when he brought them to him, they they were like, okay, it's good, run it like that. It's like when you listen to the Steely Dan track, Asia. That solo, I never knew. I knew he had played it, but he literally walked in. It was the last thing recorded for that particular tune. He did six passes of the solo, 35 minutes. He packed up his horn and he was done. That's all it took. Half um, hour. That's, you know, and to get something as brilliant as that, that's a beautiful solo. And then uh, to me, the essence of his greatness, my very, very favorite piece of anything from Wayne Shorter, and we've got Speak No Evil and Juju and all kinds of great stuff. My favorite piece from Wayne Shorter is Nefertiti by Miles Davis. It's a simple little tune, but it's a melody that just goes back over and, and Miles liked what Shorter had cooked up so much that he took out all of his parts and just let Shorter's piece uh, kind of cycle through. And it's just a gorgeous tune in its simplicity. Um, the thing about it, they're playing, and like with Shorter, when you listen to him, you'll hear a lot of, when Marsalis did a lot of this too in the early days, you'll hear a lot of playing in unison where the, where the frontline horns are really just working together. So when you're cooking through Nefertiti, there's a piece about the middle of the song where they're going and Shorter gets out of sync just a little bit. Just He's just a tick just behind hang, Miles. Yeah, just hangs just, back. Just back, just a little. And he just takes it and he kind of gives it this classical bent. It's He takes it, and I had written in the past about it being a cannon. He just, he's playing it like a cannon. And what he did is he decided, I'm going to hang back behind here and I'm going to ride this thing. And you got this beautiful piece of harmonic dissonance that just, it feels like the tide going in and out. It's just absolutely gorgeous. And every time I hear that, I think, you know, God, it's one of my very favorite pieces of jazz in general, just a great track. And then you think about what he did with Weather Report. And there's the thing, you know, Shorter was 
was always pushing envelopes, you know. He's always trying to be innovative. Yeah, I mean, look at all the fusion stuff that came with it. But then you look at all the stuff that, that Wayne Shorter wrote for people like Miles Davis, Footprints, ESP, stuff like that. Beautiful, beautiful work. Yeah, because uh, I've read that Miles originally wasn't, his strong suit wasn't being a band leader and composing everything like how Wayne did. And originally when Shorter and Miles hooked up, so uh, Shorter had met Coltrane in 59, right around the time of Kind of Blue. And then John Coltrane was leaving the band and wanted, my, or uh, I'm sorry, he wanted Wayne Shorter to replace him as Miles' sax player. And Miles at this point did not know that he was leaving the band. Uh, Coltrane had told him this over the phone. So when he suggested his um, Shorter as a replacement, he just hung up the phone. And that was like, Shorter was kind of discouraged by it because he thought maybe he wasn't good enough or that he didn't like what he heard or whatever it may have been. And who knows what the actual reasoning was. Miles could have just been like, well, fuck, I gotta, I have to process this for a minute. I'm losing my other star here. And then he joined up with uh, the Jazz Messengers for a few years after that and then went back and then hooked up with Miles and then did, I mean, countless amount of, like, he was on Nefertiti, uh, Miles in the Sky, Bitches Brew was obviously hugely innovative, and then he went on to do other things. But just the amount of stuff that he got put on with Miles and then going from hanging up the phone to the guy who was supposed to be your replacement to allowing him to shine on your own record taking place over your own parts was like it spoke for his music and what he could do with it very much the way wayne shorter himself worked too you know it's a lot of it's a side of miles too that a lot of people don't necessarily see either when you go back and you look at what he did with kind of blue you've got bill evans you got winton kelly you know he knew coltrane you know he was showcasing a lot of a lot of talent too and there were a lot of artists at the time that you know worked that way donald bird was another yeah. where you would find these folks get them on build them up teach them how to play or work in your setting or whatever it happens to be and and move on and you know look at all the great players that came through yeah. miles band from bill evans all the way to marcus miller basically you know, Same with Art Blakey's yes. Jazz Messengers. I mean, there was Lee Morgan in there, Wayne Shorter was in there, Wynton Marsalis was in there at one point. Uh, they're just like the list yeah, goes on and on and on and on. Yeah. I mean, he brought on tons of careers, but Blakey didn't like being a band leader. And I feel like as a drummer, it would be, I don't know, you are kind of the band leader. Like you, you and the bass player, you're the the whole baseline foundation for everything that's happening on top of that. Like you're the structure that everybody else is following the rhythm of to go off of. But you capsulized Art Blakey better than anybody I've ever heard talk about Art Blakey when you talked about his left hand. Oh, the baseball bats? That's yeah. <laughs> yeah. His left hand. I have a whole nother way of listening to Art Blake, because I was always he just hits so hard. Like that's why to me I love him. Like I mean, there's tons of jazz drummers that I really enjoy. Like Philly Joe Jones is great. Um, Max Roach is great. But like nobody has that snap like how Blakey does. It's like he, it's like he plays with the bottom end of his sticks. Even like I know he doesn't, but it's like he's he's got a heavy hand and it just it rings throughout the music. And I think that's what drew me to Blakey so much is his solos are like. They're almost like heavy metal solos. Right, like he's that's what I was jamming say, through out there. He's like the fucking rocker of the drummers, you know. But what a great eye for talent and all the people that come through. And man, you know, Monin is just a classic. You and know, it's a jazz standard at this point. Like people, I'm sure there's jazz bands all across the world that they're like, okay, we're gonna use this to show you how structure works. Yeah, definitely. I got a question. Go ahead. So it's off of jazz. What happens after for you after jazz? Where did you? What was your next musical endeavor, as far as what you were into? I'm an old pretentious progressive rocker. Um, I, I like. I started, you know, 
I liked all the, the rock stuff as a kid. You know, for me, I won't make it too crazy, but my awakening, I can actually point to it. 1978, okay. when I heard the Cars and I heard the Kings and all kinds of different stuff like that, kind of worked through. And as I got to play and do stuff, for me, it all happened when I heard Rush. Okay. Um, I was just, a, oh God, what, 11 or 12 when Moving Pictures hit. And I heard Tom Sawyer and you see Neil Peart play. And from there, you know, it was back through the catalog. And then, you know, Rush takes you to Yes, takes you to King Crimson. Well, now I know why you wanted to drum. Yeah, yeah you're pretty you know? you're good. You know, it's true. And so we really have lived in that. Uh, we lived in that world for really the longest time, you know, and then, you know, all the way through to bands now, you know, like Porcupine Tree and Stephen Wilson and, you know, Pineapple Thief and all that kind of stuff. That's musically where, you know, outside of jazz, I've really lived. And I think it's probably just a lot to do with ADD brain of some sort, you know, because you got to just have so much Oh yeah. Going on. Oh yeah. But I always appreciated the musical intricacy of what a lot of these folks do and the theory behind it. Uh, I love old Genesis, uh, especially the early Peter Gabriel right. stuff. I really love that. Uh, I used to really be into you know things like New Order, Bauhaus, Joy Division. Yeah, um, I'm a big supporter of all those bands. And then you know there probably is outside of everything else my all-time favorite band. You know, it, it's the cure, and I've lived on the cure for 30 years. Yeah. You know, so that's just kind of how it went. And then it was meeting Ryan. Ryan just totally reawoke my interest in jazz. And then he took me down all the dark metal roads and, you know, just learned all of that kind of stuff, you know, because we got our Metallica records and yeah, yeah. Megadeth records and, motorhead and all that sort of stuff but yeah by and large i'm still... my job in the record store and podcast is to take people past metallica and you do a great job of it. <laughs> i love craft work yeah 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 um it was like what you did one day i was listening to one of your podcasts and you talked about soft cell yeah yeah and i'm like i haven't listened to soft cell and you know to me being that far removed from like well it's tainted love you know, mm. and then you go back, and, and you're it's like, like, dude, it's so much more than yeah, that. Song. Absolutely is, but yeah, that's super so, underrated band. It is, and then I've lived in the electronic world. Right, that's, that's really like, you know, Boards of Canada and Aphex Twin are two of the, my real big favorites. And then there was a series of records done in the early 2000s, and it was really great to see them redone. But there's a dude, uh, Albanoto, and he really kind of works in an electronica type area. And he worked with a Japanese pianist named uh, Ryuchi Sakamoto. And they did five records together. Uh, and they call it the Virus Series. And, you know, it's kind of this ambient piano electronica sort of thing. And really lived in that a lot. And I like a lot of today's modern classical too. In fact, when I met Ryan, that's really where we were. I was listening to a lot of like, Max Richter, um, Olafur Arnold's, Johan Johansson, a lot of that European modern more contemporary stuff. Um, artists. Yeah, really interesting stuff. Um, I like Max Richter a lot. Yeah, the Blue Notebooks, highly, highly recommended. You know, great record. But yeah, that's where we've. So, but yeah, I mean, I'm just kind of all over the place. But yeah, if it ain't jazz, a lot of times it's it comes back to you know, progressive rock, gotcha. especially Rush. That's Rush, The Cure, that's my jam. I feel like maybe just because it's the newest to me, but jazz over the last few years has piqued my listening interest more than most other things because I understand metal, I understand hip-hop, I understand how it's made, how it works, how it's constructed, how what goes into writing a song, blah, blah, blah. And with jazz, like, it's all new to where I'm unfolding all of this, so it piques my interest a lot more to where I'm more tuned in and trying to learn, and I have learned, like, Blue Note has been great for that because you can almost buy everything blindly to where 
if it's on the label, it's good. Like they pretty much did not release any bad music. I'm sure they had a, in an 84 year career, they've had strong suits and weak points and kind of little fall offs and whatever. But for the most part, I mean, they didn't really put anything out that was bad, especially when it comes to the era between like the 50s and 70s. It was like an impeccable run of everything that was put out. And then when they started to go into like Mad Lib, which was later in the 2000s era, it was cool to see somebody that worked with people like MF Doom and a bunch of other highly reputable rappers. Their like basis for the groundwork of making their music relies on Blue Note Jazz. Like that was where their samples came from. That was where the music came from. And um, it was a tribe called Quest that like really got me into jazz in general, just because of how heavy they went on the jazz samples. So I've always looked back in samples to be like, oh, where did this come from, or where did this come from? And a lot of it was funk and whatnot. And then I got fell into all that rabbit hole. But then. Jazz has been like the most exciting to me to fall into, I think. There's so much great stuff happening. And it's like when I listen to your podcast and the things that you guys talk about, and when you think about what jazz sounds like today and what jazz is going to look like 10 years from now, it's really your generation now. You listen to now the infusion of beats that are now in jazz and some of the really innovative things that are happening there. And you've really got to give, to me anyway, you got to give a lot of credit to people like Don Was, who are willing to say, okay, this is not traditional jazz, but we're going to have to find ways, you know, to grow. And when you really kind of think about the trajectory of jazz from, you know, 1938 when Blue Note started to today, you know, you had bebop, post-bop, hard bop. It's all, yeah, it's always, it's always changing. You know, well, the beauty of jazz is it's always a reflection of the times. And what's contemporary, what's happening out there, generally jazz reflects that in some way. And it's really interesting, you know, when you listen to, like, Blue Note now is doing some of these series, you know, where they're giving you, like, EP samplers, and they're bringing people in, and they're letting them do these kinds of things. Or you get great records, you know, like J.D. and Tommy, or I drop it all the time, but, you know, you have a lo-fi sounding, rhythmic, very contemporary sounding jazz record to sit right alongside Julian Lage, Gerald Clayton, uh, and then they're out there and people like Don was, they find Induzo Mahakatini in South Africa, and now they want to infuse all of that stuff. So you'll have all of that influence that comes pouring in and it mixes with the beats. And then you'll have some vocalist somewhere that figures out how to put all that shizzle yeah, together. Yeah. And you've got a whole new, kind of like how Fusion came along. You know, it's you're going to get a whole new exciting brand of something here very, very, very soon, and, I think. And that's what, um, that's what I'm always waiting for is oh. like, you know, is that that next record, that next song to be like, oh, shit, you know? They have a lot of newer artists who are great, though. Like Robert Glasper is one yes. of them who is a great piano player. And then, like, Terrace Martin's done stuff on Blue Note. I don't... I think Kamasi Washington's on Columbia, if I remember correctly, but he's another artist who's an amazing sax player who's, like kind of keeping the art of the old style of jazz alive and bringing new things to the table to sort of take the younger generation to be like, hey, like, yes, there's my influential standards that I'm building off of here. And then, like, here's my twist on it, though. Like, the Epic, which is a Kamasi Washington album, I believe I borrowed you at one yep. point. It's long. It's three parts. But it's, I mean, it's like there's a... There's a mellow part the album to it, and then there's, like, a crazy, like, kind of hectic, like, not like war, but, like, just all these different things coming at you from one way or another where it's all, it's not angry, but it is, it's played angrily. Like, 
And I think that's really cool. And in, you've watched the Blue Note documentary behind the, is it behind the note or yep. beyond, beyond the note? The, beyond the notes. Beyond the notes. That had like Wayne Shorter and Herbie in there working with all these newer artists and putting together these different compositions. But these legends are helping the younger artists bring on the legacy of Blue Note and keep it how it was. Like, And Don, that took over the company, Like, he sat down with Wayne Shorter originally when he bought it out to see how Alfred and Frank Wolf did by their artists and wanted to continue on that treatment for everybody so the music still stayed with the you know the amazing quality that it had there's so much interesting stuff just to kind of build on your point there's another another artist uh emmanuel wilkins who kind of works in that little more traditional vein but um you're talking about how you know the social consciousness of the music and stuff comes through and this is another one where you're he had uh, the records called The Seventh Hand. Mm -hmm. And basically it's about the universal truths of uh, human existence, I guess, striving. But basically it's a record that's done in seven part. And you've got a lot of improvisation, different things going on through. But then you get to this last track and it's called Lip. And it's 26 minutes long, but it's just like build up the record builds and builds and builds and builds and builds. And then the whole catharsis just happens. The whole record just kind of resolves itself over the course of this 26 minutes. It's a little bit of a challenging listen at first, but really very much in the vein of what you're talking about. You know, there's just folks doing really, really, really exciting stuff out there right now. It's kind of like Pharaoh Sanders, the creator, has a master yep. plan. Like, you got to... It's that long for a reason. Like, you have to let it build on you. You're not just going to hear the first two minutes of the song and be like, okay, that's the song. Like, it's it's like character development, pretty much. Like, you're letting that record build upon you. And then to some people, I mean, they don't like listening to 25, 30-minute songs. Like, I'm a big Opeth fan, so to me, I don't mind long songs. I think they're great. Um, some of my favorite songs are long as hell. And there's bands like Caius that made like four song albums to where they put each song, there's four songs mixed into one song and then four songs into another song. And they did that so people would listen to the entire thing all the way through instead of just picking one or two songs. And I like when any genre of artist does that, um, except I will say a 30 minute hip hop song is way too long. <laughs> um, but other than that, like a metal song, a jazz song, like even if you had just an instrumental, like it's, I appreciate when you can take that long of a song and make it something that people can actually sit through and you're like, that's to, wow, that's that the was key, 20 right? minutes. Get them to sit through it. Yeah, because people's attention spans are short, and so it's hard to latch day. them on to be like, hey, here's a 25 minute song when the average song's four minutes or so. Mm -hmm. It's like with podcasting, like, it's a lot harder to get somebody to go sit for an hour and a half or do whatever for an hour and a half and listen to the whole episode versus you got a three minute song. You might be able to get 400 people right. to stream it in a day, whereas with podcasting, you're typically not going to get that right away. So I already asked John, but Jeremy, what's your favorite of Wayne Shorter's albums? I like schizophrenia, but that's just because that's the first one that I heard. <clears throat> Which is usually the case with everything I hear. Almost everything is like it's the first thing I hear, and um, it makes the best impression. Right, and that's the first impression I got of him. Um, Speak no evil. It's a very close second. Yeah, I really, really like that album as well. But um, yeah, Speak No Evil. I think is my favorite of his. I know Schizophrenia. There's a song on there. Schizophrenia. The song itself is like it's probably my favorite track of by. That gets a tone poet reissue here. Yeah, it's kind of down later, the line. later in the year. Eighty four two thirty nine maybe, or two nine. It might even be farther down than that. Two ninety two. I don't know. I just looked at it. Yeah, it's on the list, but it's not later till later in the year. There's a song, uh, track five. I'm sorry if I'm butchering the name here, but Miyako. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dedicated and named after Wayne, one of Wayne's daughters. 
And I didn't know that he had a daughter that passed away. I was reading some oh, stuff on him this morning. He had a daughter that passed in a plane crash a while back. And then I think he had a wife that passed away as well at some point. Yep. The only thing I have to say that I haven't heard you guys say yet is apparently he was known as the weirdo in school, which I thought that just made me like him even more. Yeah, because he was big into sci-fi. Yeah, he was like a... Comic ass, books like, and shit like that, and I know he was nerd dude. Uh, he practiced Buddhism yep. from the seventies, pretty much throughout his whole life. And but I mean, really, what is weird? It's just no, no, exactly. That's why I mean, I think it's funny. Weird people are usually the most successful people. Yeah, that is true because they have the most to add to it, and you get a completely different take. And then what was once known as weird is eventually known as the it thing, right? Things always come in cycles. Yeah, it's amazing how it works. But, oh, I know. Yeah, you know, but yeah, speaking of evil, man. But it's funny you mentioned schizophrenia because that was something yesterday I hadn't pulled out in ages. Yeah. And that was the one yesterday I decided to play. And it's like, wow, this thing. I'd forgotten how great yeah, that, I record that record is. I took it over to uh, our uh, mutual friend Bill's about a month ago because he hadn't heard it. And that was the first time I played it again in probably like a year or something. And then then he died. And it's like, dude, when he texted me, I sent him a dirty message back because I was at work. It was like, that's just not nice to say. You could have waited till later, dude. <laughs> totally disappointing, man. I texted John right when I texted you, too, because yeah. I had seen somebody on Instagram posted rest in peace to Wayne Shorter. And I was like, oh, no. So then I went in and read the article and seen what happened and everything and was like, oh, wow. And just seeing, like, the amount of people online from all different areas. It's like, uh, I seen, like, Flea from the Red Hot Chili Peppers was like... Yeah, there were so many them. people that I didn't realize were, in, were like, down yeah. with Wayne Shorter. Yeah, it's crazy. I, I had, like, read an article that the the heading was, like, one of the world's greatest musicians passed away today and i knew it was going to be wayne because it was right at the time so i went in read it and i didn't realize like all these people that were so influenced by what he had done and what he put out and just the amount of body of work that he had is insane like he had literally worked for i mean you think ozzy had a long career but like right. it ain't shit compared to wayne shorter's career and he was still going all the way up until even, like, right when he passed, he was working on another album because he had the Eminon album that came out in 2018, which came out with, I believe it had, like, a video that went with it or a short story or something like that. I can't remember which it was. But apparently he was working on a follow-up to that when he passed. Oh. So hopefully at some point we get to, like... Some have even if it's only partially done like uh, hopefully you get to have that in the collection i mean that influence there you know people just don't realize that, exactly miles davis gets a lot of credit and coltrane and you know they're the big names that people really know but wayne shorter bill evans wayne shorter is every bit the giant that uh, miles davis is for sure yeah yeah it's like he you're just, saying he's He's wrote so many things. He was a household name, but in different households, I guess, is the way to put it. Because, like, everybody knows who Miles Davis is. Like, I was, <laughs> I learned who Miles Davis was because of that old lady in Billy Madison that was like, if pee in your pants is cool, consider me Miles Davis. I, I don't remember how old I was when I That's seen crazy. him. And I was like, who the fuck is Miles Davis? Like, why is he peeing his pants? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. And, uh, but then I get the birth of the cool reference so I was like oh okay that's fucking that's cool but and then like I listened to Betty Davis and stuff and just I mean he's had a tremendous amount of work too but he was gone a lot earlier than what Wayne was and like I believe Miles eventually would have had the same body of work and would have kept going because that's just who he was but like I mean, Wayne has so many albums out there of just not only just of himself, but like with the weather report and stuff that he's done with other people and things that he's written. He's I think he had 11 Grammys or something like that. Yeah, yeah. he's done stuff with like some major people. 
And he was still influencing all the younger artists. Right. Like me and John were talking when he stepped away, how he helped in like Don Waz make Blue Note how it was before and carry out that legacy. And then he was helping artists like Robert Glasper and stuff. And like they get to play alongside people that are like their heroes. Like it's like you playing along side miles or in front of miles like but imagine doing that every single day like hours on end for sessions like what that would be like that's amazing stuff when you think about just how shorter i would argue shorter just had a little bit more what My miles was always looking for trends and doing things you know get bitches brew and getting into the fusion pieces and all of that kind of stuff. But when you look at, he was not the writer, the composer that Wayne Shorter was. Miles, Miles was a great reflection of the times. I mean, when we were doing the wonderful covers of the Cindy Lauper tunes and all that stuff, there's some really neat stuff. And then when he started working with Marcus Miller and doing Tutu and kind of getting into the electronic, stuff of the time it's all really great stuff but shorter was writing his stuff shorter was creating miles i think relied more on the people around yeah, him. he and had to interpret what was in front of him he couldn't i think that's a perfect way to say it jeremy is miles was an unbelievable interpreter of what's around him shorter i think on balance was a better creator that might make some people a little bit. But. No, I would fully agree. And I think even Miles himself would, because I've read it almost word for word where it was like, I mean, Wayne was, he brought out this side to him that he didn't know he had in composing and creating and writing like that, how he did. And he was never afraid to break down a barrier. You know, there was nothing he wasn't willing to try, which was great. And you know, you look at the last five years of Miles, I don't know how much the health and stuff, but Miles clearly struggled yeah. health-wise the last few years of his career, and I'm sure that that had some influence. But Shorter just kept creating and creating and creating and, you know, influencing and embracing trends and doing stuff, and that's what great artists do. I mean, we throw around genius a lot, and but he's one, I think, that really musical genius, the, the tag definitely fits. Yeah. I would agree. So let's talk some tone poets before yeah. we end up wrapping things up here in a little bit. What are you looking forward to tone poet wise? I'm going to tell first thing first, I love the Carmel Jones. Yeah, one man. That just came out. Um, the Andrew Hill is great. They're both excellent records. Uh, when the Carmel Jones was announced, I was really excited because you know, you know a little bit about that record. They did a beautiful job on that record. Um, it was nice. Like yesterday, you know, I had a chance to just be alone in the house for a couple of hours. And I took that. I've probably played that Carmel Jones record six times. Really already? I, That's I awesome. I love that record. It's just, it's that dude can play yeah i was um, really impressed it's a lot of fun to listen to i really 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 now i'm uh, gonna have to go buy it. you have to dude yeah. <laughs> because when you said that that was coming in he told me that those two albums were coming in so i was listening to him at work and i hate like i always feel like real weird listening to dad with dad listening to jazz digitally like yeah. i don't it, it just feels like yeah and so I listened to, you know, like the first song and I was like, all right, I got to hear this. And I was blown away. I was like, why, why isn't this guy more famous? You know, like, it's just it's awesome. He, it, it just paints a perfect picture. You close your eyes and you're right there. He did. You know, he went to Germany really at the height of his career. He started out West and worked on, you know, he did the remarkable Carmel Jones. He was out there four years, went back East did some work there and then just decided he was going to spend his time in, in Germany and he could work a little easier and do Man. stuff. But that record was absolutely fabulous. Uh, I'm looking forward to, Ryan probably knows this one's coming. Um, I want nothing more than to hear Donald Byrd's slow drag. Oh, um, I love 
Donald Byrd. I'm a huge, huge fan. Chant, one of my favorite tone poets. Uh, uh, the new one, I'll have to get around to it at some point. I've got something older of that. that but I like uh, that one a lot. It was uh, live at Half Note Cafe. Yeah. You yeah, know, I've streamed I, it. It's really, really good. Did it's you a, buy it? Yeah, it's in yeah. my it's in my um pile of listen need to listen to. Oh, you didn't listen to it yet? No. No. It uh, came out February third. I know. It's in my pile, dude. <laughs> I know how it goes. I got shit from back then I haven't is. listened to you too. But I like that one a lot. It was I really like live jazz records to where you can hear them kind of introducing the song. And some people speak more than others where they're like, oh, here's a little bit of background, blah, blah, blah. And then there's other people that are just dead set serious that are like, here's this song. And then they just start start going. And But I like to... I just like to hear everybody improvise off of each other because you might not get the same sounding show that you had the night before. Like somebody hits a lick like here to where... This guy picked up on it, and he's like, oh, shit, I'm going to run with that and go with that. And I like the the improvising that comes with live jazz. See, and what's so cool about that record, too, is when Bird was working with the Meisel Brothers, and I'll, that record, if I remember correctly, uh, he's working with students uh, from the university that he was teaching at at the time. On the Donald Bird record? Yeah, on the Donald Bird huh. record. I didn't know um, And... So you get that whole that's cool element of it too. That's really really cool. But yeah, I mean, I'm sure that that one's great. And then you know you'll get uh, you, slow drag is a fantastic record. So that'll be uh, that'll be something really really uh, well worth hearing. And then you know you've got Blackbird and all those other. Did that's they do great did they redo um, new perspectives yet? I don't think so. But. You're going to get a new Lee Morgan here, Infinity, I think it is. Yep. That's going to be another, that'll be a fantastic one. I can say one. I've not heard a bad Lee Morgan album. Yeah, I don't think there is one. Um, and then two. Well, his career was so short yeah, that he didn't have time to put out a bad piece album. Of shit. Yeah, it's like... <laughs> you ever watch the movie? It's uh, They just call him Morgan. I called him yeah, Morgan. Yeah. 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 Great flick. Yep. But then I know, too, the other one I'm really looking forward to is we're going to get a we're going to get another Mobley, too, which is nice. Yep. We're going caddy to caddy for Daddy. Caddy you know, for Daddy. Yeah. I like that one just because of the, the fucking name, name is awesome. But that's what drew me to the Andrew Hill record. Like, I had never heard it. I'd seen his name thrown around. But a jazz album that's titled A Dance for Death seems dark to me. And there was a song on there called Black Sabbath, which I thought was really cool, which is obviously an old horror movie. For anybody that doesn't know, that's where the... Black Sabbath band name came from. But that got recorded in 60, was it 68? And then didn't get released till 1980. Um, But the cover itself to me was really cool because you don't see, you see a lot of covers in Blue Note with black backgrounds, obviously, but the pictures are always a pink hue, a red one, blue one, yellow one, green one, whatever. But you don't ever see like the actual image of the person. So to see them carry that cover over from the CD release, because it originally had a different cover where it was just a red heel, like sitting in some leaves or something. And it was, I don't know what the cover was supposed to mean, but I think this cover that they did on this one drew people in a lot more because it looked so dark and dreary. And I don't know, it's a, it's a very soothing album, but it's also kind of... It's got some hard bop elements to it and spots too. It's got a nice groove to it. Um, you know, the thing with, with Hill, because I know I've got passing ships and Okay, I read that that was another really good one. It's a good one, but I like this one yep. much, much yeah. better. Um I, what I Hill was definitely more of an avant garde kind of player. Um interesting stuff, but like I think what makes this one so good is uh, it isn't so. It's more groove oriented. Um, it's not. It's not asking quite as much of you as a listener. So I think, like here, Dance with Death. If you're just kind of digging into Andrew Hill for the first time, yeah. that is a. That's probably the perfect place to start. 
But yeah, it, that was like my intro to it. Yeah, definitely. And I thought it. Ryan nailed it because when we were talking about it the one day, it was like I had, I had bought passing ships and I just kind of I was thinking about Black Fire and I'm like passing ships didn't really hit me. And then I saw the cover. It's like, hmm, all right, I'll give this one more chance and I'll go stream it. And like, oh, wow, you know, this is really, really, really good, you know, and Again, it's just so different for for him. You know, it's just much much easier to listen to. All of the compositional elements and the 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 stuff that he likes to do with melody and scales and you know all those compositional things he likes to do, you know, it's all there. Just he's definitely doing it in a much more relaxed setting here. It's a much more to me. It's a very enjoyable record to listen to. You know, but still, out of the two. I'm going to take the Carmel Jones every oh. single time. Just the way they came together and I kind of hear them together because I think they're yeah. kind of in the they're kind of in the same vein. I think it's kind of to what Blue Note does. You know, like you go back to the last oh, two and the, classic how they series, them, yeah. you know, you had Hutcherson and um I can't remember the other, but they seem to kind of come out in a similar I vein. I think it was was it Green is Beautiful, That's Grand it. Green? Yeah. yeah. They're kind of working that new territory. So they are kind of similar in timber and sound when they come out. And, you know, Carmel Jones, when I sat down and I first heard that, bah, bah, nah, nah, yeah, nah, that yeah. you're just like, oh, my God, what a great little riff. Yeah. It's like, God, I could ride that riff for, yeah. for an hour. It's so cool. You know, but then you listen to him just play, and the dude has chops. And you're just like... Wow, there's some Clifford Brown here and some Clark Terry and a little Donald Byrd going on. And, oh, yeah, you can great stuff. That's that's my favorite thing is to you feel that instrument. Oh yeah. You know, you. I mean, that I, I like how you can that that is speaking. That's telling the story. Not this. There's no lyrics. It doesn't have to be because you know what's going on by the feeling of that of that instrument, and that's what makes Lee Morgan so fucking great, man. I, I prefer my jazz not to have vocal like, to yeah, it. We unless it's like billy holiday or something and obviously then that's complimented but i mean i just like to let all the musicians do their thing and let it speak for themselves and to where you get like a good sax player you can almost hear what he's trying to say with the instrument yeah exactly conveying those like feelings perfectly and i guess that's the trick i guess you know yeah I think about even just old blues players, yeah. you know, when you think about what they can do just with guitar and stuff and how you really do feel the pain yeah. and stuff. It definitely, uh, it definitely happens here. Too. And even that album we were talking about before, the uh, Lady in Satin, that's definitely one you can hear the pain, dude, and feel the pain in that voice. You know, it's a, you know, so many people are kind of rough on that record. I think it's beautiful, man. The thing, it, it, I would fully agree. The beauty of that record, yeah, her voice is well past its prime, but you can hear life experience exactly. in every bit of it. And the beauty part of it with this new remaster that came out, um, the nuance really comes through in her voice. It's beautiful. You'll hear the kind of the wry twists of, of you know, just little bits of humor are there. You can tell she's kind of smiling. Son of a bitch, I'm gonna have to get it too. Yeah, <laughs> I have a, a my my I have an '80s repress um, from the CBS Masterworks, which sounds you know sounds fine, but doesn't sound that fine. Not not what you guys are saying. Get it at 45 RPM. It, yeah, it hurts, but it's 60 bucks. You know, get it at 45. You'll need nothing else. Right. Right. I have an original mono of it, and I have an original stereo of it, and this thing blows it away. Hey? It's just fine. Awesome. It's Bernie. You know, Ryan knows I'm a Bernie Grunman freak. It's kind of like Blue Note. If I see Bernie Grunman's name on it, I'm pretty comfortable it, with right, it. Right, right. And it's the same with Kevin Gray at yeah, this point. That, I was gonna say. And these things, it's just beautiful. That is worth every single penny every single penny and then the cover itself is beautiful mm -hmm. and they, you know they do the nice jacket and the inner sleeves and the pictures in there are just gorgeous but yeah there's a lot of life in that record and that's that's the beauty of it 
And I'll take that anytime. Exactly, exactly. That's what I like so much about like the Tone Poet releases, the classic series releases, the acoustic sounds, the Verve releases, all that stuff. Is it's as close as you can get to the authentic original yeah. without having to sell your firstborn to get it. It's exactly true. It's like Art Pepper meets the rhythm section. You know, yeah, so craft recordings is an another original. one that's putting stuff out. That's yeah, great. It's beautiful. You know, and to find you literally would. I've been trying to get a good original Art Pepper meets the rhythm section at a price that isn't giving up your firstborn <laughs> for a long, long time. And you'll it's just it's just not there. Not yeah. not to what I'm willing to do for right. it. But I when mean, you, like the age of those records, it's hard to find something if you're going to get something in great playable condition, you're going to pay for it because the person that has that knows what they have. Chances are they probably aren't in a hurry to get rid of it. Yep. So they're like, eh, the price is $800. If you want it, pay it. If you don't want it, I'll fucking keep it. I don't care. Well, at least now craft and, and you know, the tone poet kind of works a little different territory, which is cool. You know, the tone poets are, introducing you to lesser known pieces of the catalog yeah. and all and then the classics are kind of banging home the the ones that everybody knows but like here to put those kind of records back into your hands where i got a super audio of art pepper meets the rhythm section and it's great but to hear that mono vinyl is so nice and the stereo is even a little bit better um and to have, it's like, okay, that's as close as I'm going to get to whatever the original masters yeah. were. Bernie Grunman did it. Okay, if I die not ever having a, an original Art Pepper meets the rhythm section, I can... You're all right with it? I'm good with it. Plus, you know that like people like Kevin Gray and Grunman, et cetera, they're going to put forward the care and time and thought and listen to what they're putting out there because one, they know the legacy that it carries and two, they're fans themselves. So they're going to carry out and put out what they think sounds best. And typically, I mean, from what I've heard from both, like their ear is spot on with it. Like they bring out the highs when they need to be out. They put out the lows when they need to be out and it makes it, a really, really pleasurable listening experience. And I think like mono jazz to me is the best way to hear it. it. It just sounds the best. Like I've heard stereo blue train. I've heard mono blue train. I've heard the remaster. I've heard the original. I've heard eighties represses that are direct metal masters, uh, all over the place. And like the monos always sound the best usually. Yeah, I think you're right. It's, like now when I listen to, I've got an old mono blue train and even today, you know, it's just, that's the way it was originally intended to uh, be. Yeah. That's, that's what I go by. And that's why I think guys like Bernie Grumman and Kevin Gray, Ryan K. Smith, who does a lot of these too, the beauty of what they, what they do is they understand, at least in my opinion, as engineers, that there are times when it's good to do nothing. Yeah. 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 There are some things that were originally put out that are just, okay, that's good. To leave it how it is. Don't touch it. Yeah. It's like, well, I got to put my five dB boost on the whatever mm -hmm. frequency of the, no, you know what? Just enhance the, t I mean, cause they're working with tapes that have been degraded over. So yeah, you've got to do some magic to kind of get back to what that originally was. Yeah. Cause but, tape doesn't store too well. And that's what guides them back to these great remasters. And that's why things like the Lady in Satin records sound so great. You know, I'm sure the tapes for that living in the Columbia vault for centuries, you know, but. Vacuum you know, sealed rooms yes. now. And it gives, but at least now, you know, guys like us, we can get something. Yeah, you can get a piece of it. Get something that sounds really good. You don't have to sit and go on one of the secondhand, or, you know, one of the. Uh, the secondary sites and buy that stuff. You know, you can get some, I can come down here to the record store. I can talk to Ryan and say, Hey, can you get me a, an art pepper meets the rhythm section? And I know I'm going to get a clean copy. That sounds great. And 
it's going to be as close to the original as we're going to get. Right. And I'm willing and it's to— it's at a reasonable price yeah. where it's not— yeah. You're taking a risk when you buy something that old. You because are. you're like, especially if you can't see it, because yep. you want to pick out, you know, oh, I know. your so VG plus might be different than his VG plus or your near mint might be, you know, and it's the same with the vinyl and the jacket. Like you want both to be acceptable. Like you don't want to get a jacket that's you go to open it up and it was it's now a gatefold, but wasn't originally meant to be a gatefold. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh <laughs> so, and then you got a big gouge in here, and then maybe like what they were playing it on isn't up to par with what you're playing it on, or vice versa. And it's just there's so many elements that go to it. So when you are buying these new reissues, you're, I mean, you have the confidence that you know that they're gonna sound good and that they come out like the quality control through Blue Note is. Aside from the ones that we were talking about that are older reissues in 2015, 2014, that, that we had a couple that came in a little dirty, but it wasn't like a really big deal. But all the stuff that I see coming out in the last three, four years since they've been doing the Tone Poet series and the Classic series, the quality control is unmatched. Yeah, they, they pull out. They are uh, very, very clean when you pull them out for the first time. I'm impressed. And you know what? You're not afraid to play them, you know, right, because yeah. it's like... There are certain records I have at home that, you know, they're whatever they are. And, you know, they maybe come out once a year because I just run don't, the brush. you know, and it's like, oh, I want to protect these. Mm -hmm. You know, when, you know, again, it goes back to something Ryan said, you know, you, you buy these things to listen to them. And it's like, okay, you know, the tone poet gives you something and the acoustic sound series does too, where, you can just get them, play them, enjoy them. That's what they're meant to do. It was like, yeah, they don't I, need to stick it, you know, stay on a wall forever. That's just stay it. On I, a shelf. And, and I had a crap ton of those things. And Ryan was talking one day, and I went home and I said, you know what, dude, makes a lot of sense. And I had all these Diana Crawl records that I, I had a whole flight of them I was holding on to because I thought they'd be whatever. Right. And it's like. You know what? You bought them to listen to them. You bought them to enjoy them. And it's like, that was, and that's what you do now. It's like, if I had an original Art Pepper meets the rhythm section, you know, God, I'd probably be terrified to play it. I know my kind of blue, I'm a little hesitant to <laughs> like, take yeah. it out from time to time. But I ripped your kind of blue to reel to reel. Yeah, as you should. You know, I mean, it's <laughs> I a, did the blue train too. It's a beautiful yeah. that. You know, we don't want to go down, to, but to be a bragger, but but that that was a beautiful mono six eye of that record, and I was so lucky yeah, to get that. Right. Um, you know, but and was, you probably got it in a time where, I mean, it had its value to it, and probably wasn't real cheap. But it also, like, if you look at them now, like they're impossible to find, and they're impossible to find in good condition at that. Like, and like we said before, like you're gonna literally sell your left arm just to try to get that and then when you do get that you're like shit i spent eight hundred dollars on this record you're handling it with silk gloves you're like you in a hazmat suit yeah. and like cleared out your house where you're like everybody back up fucking move away <laughs> here it comes <laughs> and you don't want to play it like the carmel jones you said you played like six times already how many in how many years that you've had kind of blue have you played it six times I might have played it six times in the whole time I've owned it. Right, yeah, and yeah. how many years have you owned it? About 25. Okay. So, Point. and you have like the UHQR set of Kind of Blue that you've probably played more than way that more. already. Yeah. yeah, way more. So you're not afraid to actually put it on your turntable and be like, okay, I'm not degrading this piece of history right here because you're getting a reissue that is up to par with it. Yeah, yeah. I, I open everything. I listen to everything. That's the point. Yeah, um, I don't know. I no. think it's weird when people buy albums and just shelf them. Yeah. I can understand buying, like, I mean, I have some devils of shit, like certain artists that are independent artists, or I have a couple, like, misprints and stuff. But, but I mean, like, just straight I frame up. a couple things. I can see, like, that. But, like, just if you're just buying records all together, you keep them all sealed, you don't play them at all, you don't even, like, that statistic that we read that one yeah. time, it was like 49 or 50% of people don't even own record players that are buying them. 
which is bizarre to me. But I mean, it's your money. You can spend it how you want to. That I'm not here to tell you what to do with it. But but that fucks up our supply. Yeah, like you got You're people that are price that want to listen. That want to listen to it, right? Yeah. And thankfully, with jazz, like the community of jazz people seem to be. They all have a certain appreciation for the music, so you're not... I mean, there are tone poets that have gone out of stock that are up in value now, but, like, you don't see them up there in, like, the $800 yeah, range yeah, or yeah. something. Like, yeah, it might be $80 for... Like, it took me forever to find a good copy of Lee Morgan's The Cooker, and I think I paid 50 for it used, and it didn't come with the hype sticker, which was disappointing to me, but is what it is. Um... Other than that, I couldn't really find it. But, like, for the most part, people appreciate it. And, like, the community of jazz people aren't trying to rip one another off with a hugely inflated price. Unless it comes to, like, originals, then I can understand, like, I mean, you got 1960s, 1950s mono prints. Like, you pretty much named the price you want to name. And there's no negotiation to it after that. Well, that's why I wanted to have the um, turnaround cleaned so I can compare it to on a i have an older repress of that album that i want to compare it to just to see how the remaster sounds compared to it and that's one of my favorite things to do which i did with those uh mofi sisters of mercy uh, yeah first yeah. last and always i had a another vinyl copy of that and i put on the mofi copy and then i put on the copy i had before and it was like night and day difference man as far as separation and you almost heard different things that you kind of like muddied in other things yeah i was like when i talked album. to you the other yeah. day about the corrosion or yeah. this corrosion not the corrosion how the background vocals you can hear them in like digitally and in the cds you really don't yeah, hear it like that it in. but yeah that's uh that's one of the things i really enjoy about the uh it's just comparing them to the old ones. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. So before we get way too far up here in time, I want to also ask John and then Jeremy too, and I'll throw in some myself. But um, I just want to throw out, like, give me some of your favorite jazz releases of all time. Oh. And they don't, I mean, you don't have to give me a definitive, like, five or anything, because I know it's hard to pick and choose and separate, because one day it could be this, another day it could be this, but just throw some of them out there. That's exactly it. It's kind of, but my my favorites today, uh, in no particular order, taken off uh, from Herbie Hancock, I don't know if there was a better debut record from a jazz record just watermelon man in and of itself was just such yeah. a legendary track uh soul station from hank mobley that was one ryan turned me back on to that's on my favorites list also oh god it's that, so groovy it's been and i know people talk about yeah this isn't heavyweight or whatever his tone is warm and round and beautiful and that record is so much fun to listen to um heavy weather uh from weather report that's a big favorite of mine i love uh ryan had talked about this one a couple of weeks ago uh porgy and bess uh yeah. miles's take on that uh i thought it was a really interesting to watch you know to listen to how miles uh worked against the score and then another one from that era that i love a lot is miles ahead uh it's with Gil Evans and the orchestra and stuff. It's a little bit different style of playing, but um, it's really, really... That was a Columbia release? Yep. Yeah, I believe I have that. And then it's kind of funny when you think about it. Um, Miles did that record when Elvis was recording All Shook Up. <laughs> so that just kind of gives you a little bit <laughs> of perspective funny. about yeah. when, it, uh, <laughs> when it came about. But uh, Donald Byrd's Blackbird, yeah. I think that's one... That needs to be. In. I got into more of the funky jazz era, kind of, but I love that record. That was actually, that would have been the second bird that I heard, like, <laughs> bird that I heard. Um, Thank You for Funking Up My Life was the first Donald Bird that I remember buying. And it was at a record show here. And 
I always liked when people use the word funk to improvise fuck. Yeah. Like the Brothers Johnson did it. And like I seen that and I was like, oh, this is going to be funky. And that was like my first introduction to Bird. And then you go back and realize you're like, oh, wow, this guy was on Blue Note in like the 60s in its heyday and like was up there with some of the jazz legends that were on the label. And he wasn't just like a, a 70s, 80s funk artist. You know, too. If you have it, be sure to check out Places and Spaces. That is a fantastic uh, Donald Byrd record. It's live. And uh, just uh, a lot of a lot of fun. It's a little bit disco. It's a little bit fusion. It's very representative of the times, but a fantastic record to listen to. You know, we already talked about Speak No Evil. You know, that's one folks have got to have. The Sidewinder. That's one thing that this, with you guys, you know, I'd always kind of lived in the Miles Davis mm -hmm. world. Give me a Lee Morgan record now just about any day, and I'm going to be one happy dude. I love the Sidewinder. It is a really, really great record. I think that was like his first release as a, his own solo band leader, if I'm not mistaken, or think. right on early in there. I don't remember if it was exactly the first, but I know it was early on. Great record. Um uh, Oscar Peterson's Night Train, great record. Uh, you know, alongside of Heavy Weather, uh, you got to have Herbie's Headhunters. You yeah. know, fantastic fusion record. And then Gil Evans, Out of the Cool. Um, a little bit different, but I think always well worth your time. I have a mono copy of that that I've been trying to sell forever, but I'm going to end up just taking it because nobody's bid on it yet or anything so i'll just keep it in my own collection doesn't well, bother me doesn't bother me any <laughs> um i'm a big bill evans fan uh and i would say any waltz for debbie and sunday at the village vanguard i mean just about anything in in his riverside era is is beautiful the newer reissues the one that, that have they, come out yeah that's what i was just great. gonna say is the reissue that they just did of uh the trio. It was the black one, not the trio, but it was live at something or other. Yeah, I it's, can see it. it's like live at Town Hall. I think it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what it was. Oh yeah, great yeah, that, record. That Did is, you pick that yep, up too? That's yeah. amazing. Record, that album man. was great. Oh, that thing sounds so fucking clean and good. And then, was that acoustic sounds? Yeah, yep, yeah. It was acoustic sounds. And then of course you know you got to have Love Supreme. Yeah, yeah. But people always leave out Giant Steps, and I think that's Giant Steps is. Probably my favorite Coltrane. I mean, like, Blue Train's hard to top, and it's a standard and everything, but if you're taking away from that, aside from that, like, without picking the obvious, I, I'd pick Giant Steps. That's a fantastic record. And then... There was a reissue of that a couple of years ago that I... I don't... There was, like, a supply chain issue with it or something, and I still have yet to be able to find it. I've been hunting it for a long time now. And I can't remember if Craft Recordings did it or Verve did it or who put it out, but it was one of the direct from analog transfers, and I have... It must have been Verve, because I have the Love Supreme they did of the same fashion. I have a Giant Steps, but it's... um. Like a yeah. Waxworks one? Yeah, something yeah. like that. DOL, it's really mediocre. DOL, yeah, that's the other. They're like cheap. They're good to have to just like, if you're trying to pick up this record for 20 bucks as which like is, an intro which, type of which thing. Which is why I got it, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And I, I do order those for the store from time to time because not everybody wants to spend $40 on a, or they might not have a stereo that even brings out what the needs to be brought out in that. And they just want to hear and enjoy the music at a reasonable price. Like, I don't mind buying those cheaper reissues to stock in here. Uh, uh, side note, the blue note, or the blue train, fucking... The Tone Poet that they did? No. I have a stereo version of, I believe it's a DOL or something. Uh-huh. <sighs> Garbage. It's a good frisbee, man. <laughs> it's just, I, I, it's that, it is that bad. I, I don't know if it's because I listened to that, to the... The mono one, the repress, that's yeah. amazing so much, but it's like, ugh. There I've heard a, quite a few different versions of that. Yeah. I've heard the DVD audio. Um, I've heard the super audio. I've heard the mono, the stereo, the master, the new tone poets. Um, I have the, I, 
I want to say it's like an 83 direct metal master I have a stereo copy of, and then I have the mono tone poet one that they just did. I was going to buy the stereo one just because. How's the stereo, the direct metal master one? It's so. good, but it doesn't hold up to the mono one. Right. Like it, and then when you hear the, the DVD audio, it's like, wow. Um, it, it's like on fire, the whole record. Like when you get some of them trumpet solos that Lee Morgan yep. kicks out, mm-hmm. you're like, holy shit. Yeah, I know that the DOL or whatever it is, it's their source material is. Yeah. Yeah, see, there was a period of time like in the... I don't know if it was the late 2000s, early 2010s. They were kind of cranking these things out. I mean, there was a good label at the time. I think it was some sort of an, a subsidiary of Blue Note. They were okay. OJC's, Original Jazz Club. Yeah. They were doing stuff, but then you had this other, and we always called them Scorpios, and it was a lot of stuff like that that I bought, I don't know how many uh, in that, that yeah. are exactly what you're talking about. I've got a, I've got a Mingus, uh, uh, Black Saint, uh, or yeah, Black, Black Saint, Saint the Center Lady, and it's a frisbee. Well, right and now it's kind of like, well, I have it there, so whenever I get a better copy, you know, yeah, it's you like a placeholder. It. You mm-hmm. know, yeah, I've done that with plenty of stuff, but it's all part of collecting. You gotta trade up, collect up, get with what mm-hmm. you can at the time, and then hold out for something because otherwise you try to you try to get every single thing that comes out i mean you drive yourself absolutely yeah, nuts that's that's a yes you gotta pick and choose man. and that's why i didn't pick up carmel jones because i had just picked up andrew hill de la soul um there was some Ty, right. Ty ferris stuff that had just come out that i picked up and i had i bought like eight other records that week and i was like man i gotta set something back so my kid can eat <laughs> now, like, yeah. but you know a new release like that eventually it, it's going to be around for a while so yeah. if the opportunity presents is can certainly circle back no i'll definitely i'll definitely pick it up yeah it's a great record yes it is. i do have copies of wayne shorter's adam's apple coming in next week great record because i've had like 10 of them here and I've sold every single one and have yet to be able to get Mm -hmm. my own. Mm -hmm. So I finally have like the last few that are on my distributor coming so I can take one and then the other two can go in the store for anybody interested in picking it up. Is that a Tome Poet? No, it's a classic series one. And it sounds great. Does it? I have an older copy of that album too. Did you pick up Adam's Apple when I I had it or no? No? Okay. I mean, like I said, I had a copy of it. Um, you got any more favorites, John, that you're trying to add? Last one would be, uh, uh, Gets and Gilberto. I, I know that's not That's a record that's hard for me because of, like, if you take the vocal out of it, it's great. I love it. It's an amazingly composed album. But when you add that Spanish shit that they put over it, (laughs) I'm like, fuck, dude, I can't. It's like borderline mariachi music for a minute. What's wrong with you, puto? (laughs) Like... I just can't do it. It's like there's a there's a Dexter Gordon that we had in here for a while, and um, Phil Heimroll actually just bought it. I think it was the other side of Midnight or the other round of Midnight or something like that. It was a great record, but there was one track on there that had a vocal over it that just demolished it. I was like, I can't, I can't listen to the whole thing just because of that track. Like, I wish you could like. Just turn the vocal down and then play out the rest of the record. See, but that's the beauty part of it all, you know, what everybody just kind of has their own interests and, you know, what what turns you on. And, yeah. Yeah. So what what's your you, list? Jeremy? Well, my, like, uh, I'm going to say another uh, singing one that we talked about. I love Chet Baker, dude. Love Chet Baker. Even, and even if he doesn't sing, I love his, um, his trumpet does the singing for him, but it'd be like Chet Baker sings would be that album. That um, let's get you know, let's get lost. All of those songs, I'm down with that shit. Jimmy Smith, uh, Home Cooking probably. Is it Home Cooking? Yep. Yep. I get that. There's Home Cooking and who does Out to Lunch? Eric Dolphy. Okay, yeah, yeah it's like those two. I'm always like with the. That's a great sounding cooking. classic series record too, by the way. Of course, and then um, I just picked up that Dave Pike the other day. I'm really uh, getting down with that. Yeah, that's another good record. That's like, 
I like there's a time and place where you want to listen to smooth jazz instead of hard bop mm-hmm. jazz. Like I really love hard bop. That's like my bread and butter when it comes to jazz. Uh, like Art Blakey. I mean, just yep. like I said before, the way he's banging them sticks. Like that's that like there sold me to where I jumped head first into the rabbit hole. So, but that Pike's Peak record is phenomenal. I um I didn't put any Blakey on here because of that. Like I think. We were talking like 11 or 12 Banky released. Uh, they're all good. I don't know. It's hard to pick one, you know? Yeah. Um, I have. Indestructible, I, I, have I guess, is what, uh, the last one I listened to. So we'll say that one. I have 16 Blakeys, I Ooh, think, or something he's like a that. Fan. <laughs> yeah, 16. <laughs> yep. Um, Lee Morgan, that Carmel Jones album. That's pretty much where I'm at. Lady and Satin. Those are my favorites. Which Lee Morgan? Um. What's the one with the woman on it? Uh, it, do, it like doesn't even look like a Blue Note album. It's yeah, weird. It's like Carumba or something. Yep. Yeah, I like that album. I have that one too. Yeah. Just because it sounds different than any of the other ones to me. I'm looking up right now so I get the actual name of it. And while Ryan, you're looking. Yeah, it's Carumba. Yeah, that's the one. And then a tone poet, if you can ever find it. I know I got super duper lucky one day, but. If you can ever find a, a tone poet of Lee Morgan's Cornbread. Cornbread. That thing I have a fantastic. Does it? I, don't have I have an 80s reissue of it, but not a tone poet. Damn. It's a beautiful sauna record. I do have, I have the Raja tone poet, um, and then I have like his classic series stuff, the Cooker tone poet, and some others. <laughs> Dial S for Sunny. Great I'm listening one. To that. That's a good one, too. You know, his uh, My Conception Tone Poet is fantastic, My too. Conception, yeah. That is, it's a great sounding record to start with, but also to the band. I have record. it, but I don't have, like, the Tone Poet one. Oh, man, what a great, it's just a great record to listen to. I don't know what, I gotta look that up when I get out of here. Yeah, that's a fabulous one. What about you, sir? I mean, I'm just, I'm always all over the place, I guess. Yeah. No, um, my list, I had Pharaoh Sanders' Message from Home. Great record. Yeah. I've, I only own the CD. I've never been able to find a vinyl copy. I don't even know. There's, I'm sure there is one, but it was released in 96. So and that was like prime CD era. So it's hard to find a record of, but I would imagine at some point they'll we'll reissue it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Wayne Shorter, Speak No Evil, which would have been closely tied with The All-Seeing Eye. I really liked that record a lot, too. It was cool that he had his brother on there as well. And just, like, the concept for the album, cool, like, when you flip it over and read how the influence for all the songs and everything was really good. Um, Like you said, Hank Mobley's Soul Station, which is just really groovy and fun. Um, I like Curtain Call a lot, too. Um, Bill Evans, Everybody Digs Bill. Great record, yeah. Which I only have a CD copy of also. I I don't have that record. I did borrow yours at one point. Yeah. Um, It's uh, the first time I ever heard it, I was like, wow, this is this right here is how you play jazz piano. Like, it's he's got his mellow songs and then he's got his like crazy all over the place songs and piano to me is like my favorite instrument like i love piano players like alicia keys is huge for um hazel scott i like a lot and uh piano is like just the most soothing instrument i think um lee morgan's the cooker would be my favorite of lee morgan's but it's hard to really pick a favorite of his like Like we've said i don't think he's done anything bad no um art blakey I can't really pick a that's favorite, why, of, that's what I but know, like, man. I do like Roots and Herbs a lot. Um, the Witch Doctor is really good, but he has so many different live shows with the Jazz Messengers. Like, I have a live at, um, I think it's live at Bubba's or something like that, and it has Wynton Marsalis. I borrowed it to you at some point. Uh, that record's really good. Mosaic's really good. Um, Monin, obviously, Free For All, Indestructible, just Coolin'. Like, they're all, he really doesn't have any bad albums. And I know, like, later on in his career, he had a couple that were, like, they didn't portray the earlier stuff quite as well. But even, like, 
they were still good. Like uh, Chipping In is one that I can think of that was later on down the road that was still really good. I always really find good. myself looking at who's in the messengers at that time on yeah. my mood, you know? It's like, well, I know I want to listen to Blakey, but who do I want him to be playing with? And then you fucking go through them, you know? Yep. And then I did, like, the like two of my favorite classic series releases that have come out were the Joe Henderson's State of the Tenor. There was a volume one and volume two. And I was familiar with Joe Henderson, but those, like, kind of made me dive into him more. Just his playing was, it's very mellow, but it's, like, I don't know, it's relaxing, it's soothing, it's... But then he has like that hard bop element to it, like a little bit here and there. And it's just, they're both really great records. I can't remember if I borrowed you those or not. Yep. I believe I did. You did. I pretty much ran you through my whole Blue Note collection, aside from maybe a handful. But yeah, uh, Pharaoh Sanders, to me, like that message from home record, I love like the the different like world elements that he adds to it. And obviously message from home is meant to be like an ode to Africa and the Congo solos that he had in there, like sounded like something that you'd hear on a tool record almost. I was actually just listening to it this morning, but I listen to that all the time. And I've had people hear it at my house that are like, what the fuck are you listening to? Cause there's like, African chanting in some of the songs and like stuff like that, but it's a really fun record. But yeah, that's all I have for favorites. I mean, I have like a million others, but I, we're uh, getting up there in time, so I want to. I think it's very come difficult to a to conclusion. Pick a favorite jazz like albums. It is because they all speak to you in a different yeah. way. To where one day you might want to hear kind of blue and then the next day you're feeling more hard bop and then the mm-hmm. next day you want to listen to some west coast stuff or um jazz fusion stuff or you know like there's that's what's cool about it though is there's so many different elements that you can take and be like okay today's this tomorrow's that it's it's almost like with metal like one day you might want to hear obituary one day you might want to hear blood incantation like it all kind of yeah it all kind of depends on what side of the bed you wake up on yeah but that's all i have for blue note stuff um before we get past two hours here i'm gonna wrap this up just so we don't bore anybody to death and uh two hours they only peed once i know i'm proud of you thank you <laughs> john didn't even go to the bathroom ah, that's crazy i don't even have to pee yet <laughs> crazy crazy yeah, so, John, thank you for taking the time to come in this morning and thank hanging out with us and talking Blue Note stuff. Like, we definitely wanted your take on things just because you've been a fan longer. You understand the music more on a deeper level than what we do as far as the compositions and stuff go. And it's cool to pick your brain about that stuff. You know, but right back at you, because I've learned so much from listening to you guys and Ryan, especially on the jazz side, has sent, you know, when, when he started sending tone poets home with me and different things, you know, going back to hearing Art Blakey and Lee Morgan and all of these great things, I can't say enough about, you know, being so grateful to have people that are willing to take the time to say, hey, here's all this stuff. And it's totally reawakened my love of of that art form and you know we've just gone through so many different things and i'm so grateful for that but you know too again just with what you guys are doing here that's so awesome that you're out and not just jazz you know all the art forms that you talk about and all the music and the different insights that you bring i enjoyed your your back and forth one day over what is VG plus and what is mid minus yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah. all that kind of stuff. I you remember know, that. Yeah. It's real stuff, you know, and you're talking about things that, you know, people do look for when they're out there, but you've got a great take on music and you both have a lot to give. You both have a lot of knowledge. You're really, really good in what you, what you talk about. And, you know, I always enjoy listening to what you guys do and, I'm just glad that, you know, we thought you could, I could add a little something to what you guys Oh, I've learned so do. much today, man. I mean, you guys this has been great. been great talking all this out with you. I mean, we, I could easily do this for another hour, but... Uh, Three dudes sitting around talking about yeah, music. Yeah, could go on forever. <laughs> I mean, this is what we do day in and day out anyways, yeah. but... 
You guys but, yeah. are great, though. Thank you again, thank you. and thank you for always listening and giving us like a little bit of constructive criticism here and there, and um, you know, for cleaning records when we need records cleaned with yeah. a fucking with a nice cleaner. I gotta get our VPI up to up to standard here pretty soon, and you know, just like coming in, talking, and hanging out. Like we appreciate that you come in, and it's cool to have people's brain to pick about music because I can't always with everybody go on a level that like you and I go or me and Jeremy go like it, not everybody. I, I listen obsessively and like, I know you say the same thing. Like I, it's, it's hard to talk to people that don't have that knowledge. Yeah. And you're like, as you almost like scare them off. Or it's that like when language. it's like you date a girl and tell her you love her too quickly or yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the same with music. Like, you hear something like when Stormkeep came out and I was freaking out mm-hmm. about it. I was like, this is the best fucking thing to happen mm-hmm. in black metal in like fucking 10 years. Mm-hmm. And I still say that like, it's an amazing record and it still has that effect on me every time I hear it. But uh, you kind of like push people away with how much you appreciate things sometimes if they're not on the same level of music with you. Like everybody has their niche and whatnot. And, you know, there's some people that only listen to hip hop. There's some people that only listen to metal. There's, and that's cool and fine. I'm not saying everybody has to be like, Oh my God, what's this, this, that, and the other, like, but life's too short for one fucking genre. Yeah, man. To me, like I like, it's fun and enjoyable to, unfold different genres of music and find out the history of things like anybody young old fucking ancient whatever like i like picking their brains on music you know and you have an amazing store here too and we need places like what you have here to be able to walk into the record store and to be able to talk to people and learn stuff and what's going on i mean places like this are invaluable so you know please make sure that you you know, we know there's all those places out there and different things, but man, when you come in and work with a Ryan, you get a lot of perspective and, you know, he can work with you a hell of a lot better than the Amazon people and all that sort of stuff, you know. <laughs> yeah. Try these, calling into Amazon man, oh, about shit. records. Yeah. I mean, these are like, you know, I love to ride bicycles and these, these are like bike shops too, where people just kind of come in. There's a common interest, there's knowledge and people share and talk about things and do stuff and, you know, people in this region don't realize well I shouldn't say it that way but people are so fortunate to have a a place like this and to have you guys doing a podcast like this I think it's just great we do it to bring all the I mean our musical knowledge and like what we think is good or even what we think is bad like we try to just kind of push it out to everybody and expand everybody's knowledge expand our knowledge yeah shit works both ways and it gives us a reason to do the digging that we already did in the beginning anyways, because both Jeremy and I dig into music heavily. And for years that we've been friends, we've always bounced music off of each other and shit. And it's just, it gives us a constructive reason to actually right do those things. And then it's more, I don't want to say disciplined really, but like it's more structured to where you like, you know, you come in here with a whole set of notes and you're like this, that, and the other. And you have, you took the time to actually sit and read and unfold some f- sort of mystery about whatever music it is you're talking about or new releases with new bands. And like, that's why we like doing the interviews because if I can bring out a newer artist or a person who um, is just appreciative of music or um, a heavy collector or anything like that. Like, I like what they have to add on top of what we already bring. Absolutely. Um, Jeremy, you got anything you want to add before we wrap up here? Uh, no, I'm good. I just, uh, like, same shit as always, man. Keep listening. Thank you, John, for coming in. Thank you for cleaning my turnaround. Anytime. Yeah, thank you. Um, People listening, tune in next week. We will have another interview. I'm not going to tell you who right now, just because it'll be a surprise when it happens. But thank you for taking the time to listen. Go follow us on social media. Share the episodes. Follow the YouTube channel, even if you're not listening to it. I don't care. Just follow the damn thing so it gets spread around more. Um, (laughs) Algorithms are hard as fuck to get past in the social media world because there's millions and millions of people putting content out every single day. So anything that 
uh, you share out there. It's much appreciated for bringing awareness to the podcast and show. But um, we are out of here. Thank you for listening, and everybody enjoy the rest of your day.